Stand with me, would you please? I want you to look uh, to the 30th chapter of um, this great book that we've been studying, the book of Job. The 30th chapter. But no longer, now am I the butt of their jokes. Young ruffians, whippersnappers, why I consider their fathers mere experienced pups, but they are worse than dogs, good for nothing. Stray, mangly animals, half starved, scavenging the back alleys, howling at the moon, homeless gutter snips, chewing on old bones and licking old tin cans, and outcasts from the community, cursed as dangerous delinquents. Nobody could put up with them. They were driven from the neighborhood. You could hear them out there at the edge of town, yelping and barking, huddling in, in, in junkyards, a gang of beggars and, and no-namers thrown out on their ears. But now I am the one that they're after. You see, Job, is he was one so very prominent. Now he's feeling like he's nothing. Have you ever come to that point in your life? Come on, church. They abhor me. They abuse me. How dare these scoundrels. They, they spit in my face. Now that God has undone me, I, I'm left in my heap. That's how we felt about God. And they hold back nothing. Anything goes. They come at me from my blind side. They, they trip me up. They, they jump on me while I'm down. You ever felt like anybody kicked you when you were down? They threw every kind of obstacle in my path. They determined to ruin me. And no one lifts a finger to help me. They violate my broken body. They trample through the rubble of my ruined life. Terrors assault me. My dignity is in shreds. Salvation is up in the smoke. And now my life drains out as suffering seizes and grips me hard. Night gnaws at my bones. The pain never lets up. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. And, 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 and it seems like you're not there, Lord. God, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm tied up hand and foot. My neck is in a noose. I twist and turn. Thrown face down in the muck. I'm a muddy mess inside and out. I shout for help, God, and get nothing. No answer. I stand to face you in protest, and, and you give me a, a blank stare. You've turned, you've turned into my tormentor. That, you know, he had such a, mis, a, a misunderstanding of God, didn't he, through his pain? Sometimes that happens. You slap me around, knock me about. You raised me up so that I was riding high, and then you dropped me, and I, and I crashed. I know you determined to kill me. You put me to six feet under. What, what did I do to deserve this? Did I ever hit anyone who was calling for me help? Have you, of course, nobody here has ever felt like ever hitting anybody, right? I'm, sorry. I'm certain of that because I'm preaching to some saints today. <laughs> but this preacher preaching to you is not a saint. And I've thought in my mind that I wanted to slap some people upside the head. Whew. All right, I got that out now. It's going over the airwaves. Nobody's ever going to want to attend this church. Haven't I wept? For those who, who live a hard life and, and been heartsick over, over the lot of the poor. But where did it get me? I expected good, but evil showed up. I looked for light, but darkness fell. My stomach is in a constant churning, never settling down. You ever had that where you're, it doesn't matter if you have Pepto Bismol or whatever it is, your, your stomach is churning. It felt like somebody gut punched you. Hello. Each day confronts me with more suffering. I walk under a black cloud. The sun is gone. I stand in the congregation and protest. I howl with the jackals. I hoot with the owls. <laughs> I'm black and blue all over, burning up with fever. My fiddle plays nothing but the blues. <laughs> and my mouth harp wails laments. You may be seated. I mean, here we're introduced again, reintroduced to Job, who was the greatest man in the East that had gone through a tremendous amount of difficulty. 
He had lost everything he had. And um, I had someone that I was sitting at, a pastor's wife at the supper table when I was in Maine. And she said, well, pastor, you're, you're, preaching, you're preaching on Job. What, what do you think about Job's wife? And I said, I have a whole new um, understanding. I used to be the preacher that stood up and said, she's the one that said, curse God and die. But women, how would you feel if everything you had, all your children were taken from you? It made me see the other side. It wasn't that she was a bad woman. She, she was grieving. She was in immense sorrow. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. You, you don't want to mess with a woman that, that has gone through that, and you don't want to mess with her children. But she didn't have, he didn't have any of her young'uns to hold and caress that she gave birth to. And so we see the pain and the anguish that, 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 that this man of God is going through, but even though... Even though God and Satan had a talk together and he said, you can, you can go ahead and I'll give you some restraints and, and, and Job is, is my man and, and, and I know he's not going to curse me. And he didn't. But even though we don't curse God, sometimes we don't understand God. I mean, if you don't understand everything about God, then, then, then I'm telling you there's something special about you. How can you understand a God that's so vast? How can you understand a God that, that, that knows no depths, that knows no limits? How can you understand a God that, 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 that He could step one foot here and, and, and He could be across the world and, 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 and touch the ocean with one of His fingers? We serve a God that is immense. We serve a God that is vast. We serve a God that doesn't have any limits. But you and I limit Him. And Job is at a point of his life where he feels like God has abandoned him. And I'm talking to somebody today. Uh, if not here, they'll hear it later. And, and, and they're, they're, they're saying, I, God, I feel like you've abandoned me. I, I understand I've made some mistakes and I understand that I've messed up. But God, where are you? Where are you? I, I don't see you in the clouds anymore. I don't see you in the rain. All I see is the wind blowing, and I see it battering against my life, which is the ship of life, and I can't stand it any longer. I'm here to tell you that God is here to rescue you. God is a rescuer. Oh, I feel the anointing today. Thank God for a week off, but I feel the anointing. I'm not going to preach price as long. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But the last message we talked about in chapter 25 through 28 was God's powerful whisper. You ever had God whisper to you? Yeah, you questioned it. That's me. But listen, when it's God's voice, it never goes away. And he just reaffirms that he's whispering to you. I love you. He did it through the praise and worship today, and we did it back to him. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Daddy. I love you so much that I want to refrain from sin. I love you so much that I don't want to be caught into compromise. I love you so much that I know you're coming soon. And I need to be busy for the kingdom of God. I can't restrain myself anymore. I can't restrict myself anymore. I feel like I'm in a, in a straitjacket. But, but today, I'm going to bust out of that and I'm going to be everything you want me to be. Just like seven men went to a place along with 65, 70 other men and we had God all day speak to our hearts and put his finger on the things that he needed to do in our life and we needed to get rid of them and we did. And so now we're a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I feel like I could jump over this pulpit right now. And grab you all and give you a big hug. And let you know you're going to make it. The devil is a liar. You know the next line. And his pants are on fire. He's a liar and the father of lies. Greater is he that's in Wayne Hodge Grove in this church than the enemy that's in the world. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And I'm sick and tired of the church living in existence. We are more than existing. We are, we are triumphantly saved. But yet here's Job, this great victor that feels like he's a, he's, a, he's a victim. And I'm here to tell you that some of you, I'm going to say it with all the love I can muster up, some of you need to get over the victim mentality. You rehearse that to the devil every day and he takes that and runs with it. Maybe you were once a victim, but you're not a victim now. None of you belong to Jesus. You say, Pastor, he can't clean me up. Well, you couldn't clean you up, so thank God he's the only one that can. And boy, I tell you what, do we ever need cleaning up? If ever the church needed cleaning up, it's right now before the imminent return of Jesus Christ. 
So in the, in the chapters that we talked about in 20 through 21, uh, 29 to 31, we're going to talk, I'm going to entitle it this, No Pain, No Gain. I don't like that title, <laughs> but I feel like God gave it to me. No pain, no gain. I'm sick and tired of people, uh, you know, going up to people. We, we don't do that. We have great altar workers here. We never tell somebody comes down to the altar. As soon as you accept Jesus Christ, man, you're going you're gonna to be with it. It's just, that's just the way it is. You're, you're never going to have a problem. You're never going to have a pain. You're never going to have a sorrow. That's pure unadulterated garbage. What it means is he's buried our sins in the sea of his forgetfulness, never to hold them against us again. But don't you think that the enemy is not going to let us alone? He's going to persevere. He's going to come against us. But we know that the greater one, Yeshua, lives in us. We're in a battle, church. The battle cry has been sounded. And I'm here to tell you, no pain, no gain. If you have no pain and you're serving Jesus, I question if you're serving him. Because, because life is filled with pain. The big difference is that we've got the, we've got the pain taker. <laughs> that took it on Calvary that lives within our heart. So today I want to break down very quickly these, these chapters in 29 through 31. And remember, we've entitled this series, Waiting on God in Difficult Times. <laughs> Are these not difficult times? This world's in a mess. I get myself on side, sometimes in a tizzy and in a fret. And I'll, I'll, I feel like God's saying, cool your jets. No, he probably doesn't say that. He's just probably saying, just don't get all ranked up about that. Get in my word. Stay in my word. Stay in prayer. You know, stay in me. So as we begin today in the 29th chapter of Job, he's reminiscing on the good old days. Remember them? <laughs> oh yeah, the good old days. And by now, Job and his friends had shared three rounds of speeches. Boy, sometimes talk can be cheap. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes we like to hear ourselves speak. That P word, pride, is big. But oh, beloved, it's not about our pride. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. So the third rounds of speeches, and, and in these next three chapters, Job recalls the blessings of the past, and that's in the 29th chapter, and the pain of the present, and that's in the, the 30th chapter, and then, and then that God would vindicate him in the future, and that's the 31st chapter. I'm here to tell you that if you're true blue and you've got up off the carpet and you've shaken off that sin and confessed it to God and forsaken it, that God hears that. He hears the yearning of your heart. And he will abundantly pardon. And he wants to anoint you with a fresh anointing today like you've never walked in in your life. That's what I want for my life. So the good old days. How about them? Job opened his defense by saying that he wished. He wished that he had never been born. That was in Job 3. And now, now he closes his defense by remembering the blessings that, that his family had enjoyed before tragedy struck. I must say something to you today, church. If ever we need God's blessing on our homes, it's today. We were challenged yesterday as men about spending some time with our wives and, and those at our home praying, even if it's just a few moments, praying together, seeking God. Now, I understand that when I say this, there's an immense amount of emotions and, and a great amount of guilt that the enemy is going to try to put on you. But I'm here to tell you, God is a God of new beginnings. There's nothing like the power of prayer. We need God's presence in our homes. How many know that we can fight all the way to church and raise our hands and praise the Lord and everybody think we're holy? How do you know, Pastor? Well, I've probably done it before, you know. I've, I've come behind this pulpit, man, ready to jump, and I've come behind this pulpit trying not to make everybody look at me thinking I'm dragging. The good old days. Verse 2, oh, how I long for the good old days when God took very good care of me. Well, listen, it doesn't mean that when we're going through difficulties, no, he's not taking good care of us then, right? I mean, anybody can sing when the sun's shining bright, but only God can give us a song in the night. It's really easy when we got more, more money than we got month and everything else is happening grand and glorious to give God praise. But how about that sacrifice of praise? Now, now he's understanding this. Oh, those good old days. When we, when we go through trials, it's, it's, natural. it's natural for us to long for the good old days. 
I remember those good old days. Two weeks after I was out of Bible college, I prayed a prayer. I said, God, I never want to pastor a church in a house. And, and, and the first church I pastored was in South Weymouth, Mass. They didn't have a church building. They had a house. The living room was the sanctuary upstairs where we lived. Only one bathroom. Had to get through our living room and bedroom to go, go to the bathroom. We had, we had, uh, no, we had no hot water. We had, we had backs in the attic and we had rats in the cellar. But we pushed 80 people into that living room until we burst the seams. We had a bus. We had young people. We had a Saturday night uh, uh, time where, where it, was a, it was a coffee house. It was called the House of the Risen S-U-N. No, S-O-N. The kids had, 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 had taken the bottles and they cast them in. And they had a full, ba they had a full bus. And it, and it was psychedelic. I mean, it was painted. Oh, man. Everything you could imagine. And they called it the Jesus Machine. That's the church that I ended up in. It was between that and Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island. And I said no to Newport, Rhode Island. And said yes to the house that I never wanted to be in. Go figure. You know how much I got paid? $30 a week. The good old days. Woohoo! Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Man, now it'll cost you, maybe you get 10 cups of coffee. That could, that could do pretty harm to $30, can it? The good old days. The good old days. But I want to tell you, in Job's case, the good old days, they were really good. Weren't they not? Amen? Let's remember the goodness of God and, and never forget His goodness. Come on, church, let's never forget the good. God is good. It's one of His attributes. God is extremely good. The past, the past must be a, a rudder to guide us, but it's not an anchor to hold us back. If we try to duplicate today what we've experienced yesterday, we may find ourselves in a rut. And I'm preaching to some people right now that you've worked yourself, you've wormed yourself into a rut. You're in a rut. You come to church, it's a routine, it's a rut. Uh, you read your Bible, it's a routine, it's a rut. You talk to people, you don't want to talk to people, you just want to be by yourself. You are fed up beyond your mouth, up over your head, every part of you. But I'm here to preach this message because I believe it's ordained for you to hear the word of the Lord. Listen, I want to tell you, I'll give you a definition of the good old days. The good old days are a combination of a bad memory and a good imagination. I like that. Oh, that bears repeating. The good old days are a combination of a bad memory and a good imagination. <laughs> but Job really had some good old days. And, and so, so we're, we're going to go over this. And, and sometimes it seems like that, 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 our, that our yesterdays haunt us uh, and, they, and they stop us from our, living in our todays and, and, and our tomorrows as God gives them to us. And so Job mentions some things along the way. He mentions, first of all, the joy of the presence of God in his home. The strength and weakness of the church is the home. And every one of us have been battered by that. I'm not here, you know, to put guilt on anyone. We've gone through some good times and we've gone through some, time to, some hard times in our homes. Amen? Can, can, can you come to agreement with me today? But in Job 29, 2 to 6, uh, in the Message Bible, it says, Oh, how I miss the golden years when God's friendship blessed my house. Oh, God, bless our homes. Bless every home, Lord. Bless every home in this church. Bless every home, God. Pour out your spirit upon them. Help people to be picked up from the carpet and stop living in guilt and, and make a fresh new start. God, may your blessings be upon our home and upon our families, be upon our children, our husbands and our wives and our grandchildren, in our case, our great-grandchildren. Let the blessings of God that make rich infiltrate our homes. There's nothing like a home that's in turmoil and in pain and anguish. The hurry you go, the behind you get, not grammatically correct, but, but here's what he's saying. Oh, how we need that God's blessing. And he's reminiscing the good old days. God's presence and, and light was, was in his home. It was in his family. It was in his wealth. It was all over him. Verse 6, when everything was, was going my way and nothing seemed too difficult. 
For some of you today, you are facing something that just seems too difficult. And the only thing I can tell you is lay it down at the master's feet. Jesus went through the most difficult hour and he yelled out, Tetelestai, Tetelestai. And, and, and he laid down his life. They didn't take it. He laid it down voluntarily for you and I to give us an abundance of life, to give his blessing upon our life. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, boys, you, you spend a day with seven men and, 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 and 65 others in a place that, that's hungry for God. You don't come away the same. You know, you don't just come to a lady's Thanksgiving meal on a Saturday night and just have fun. It's fellowship. It's koinonia, but it's God's presence that sustains us. Oh, God, bless our homes. God wished that uh, what we wish sometimes, oh, to be in the, the prime of our life. Yeah. You ever felt that way? You know, we need, I need, I need to age gracefully. How you doing with that, Pastor? Lousy. You shouldn't be so honest. Somebody has to be. There are too many phonies in the pulpit. We need to be honest. You know, and, 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 and in our honesty, understand that the future is going to come whether we like it or not. Jesus is going to come whether we like it or not. And I would just have to say to you, make sure that you're ready and make sure that I'm ready. To know how to grow old is a, is a masterwork of wisdom. It really is. Um, Henry Emerald says this, and, and one of the most difficult chapters uh, in, in the great art of living, that is life, growing old. It's one of the most difficult chapters. The ladies, man, you know what? I tell my bride, she, she looks as good as when I married her. And I'm telling the truth. But we're all going to age, right? I mean, you could have rock hard abs and still go into hell. <laughs> you can have five years on a treadmill and still go to hell. Or you could go there reasonably plump. <laughs> so Job, Job is going through it, church. He is a man of God, the greatest in the East. So you're not alone. You say, well, I'm not Job. Well, then you're Jobette. <laughs> to know how to grow old, help me, Jesus, please. Please. There's a lot of things that I'd like to add. Growing old, there's a lot of things I'd like to subtract. <laughs> Come on, can I get a witness? <laughs> Oh, don't go any further with this. You're going to get in trouble, Pastor Wade. Verses 11, 7 to 11. <coughs> you know, it, it's, 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 just a, it's the art of living. And then Job lists the joy of, 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 of a respect for others. He respected others, and others respected him. People who know me spoke well of me. My reputation went ahead of me. I mean, imagine that. I mean, tremendous. And then another source of joy, uh, joy that Job experienced was, was ministry to others. You can see it in verses 12 through 17. He ministered to others. Listen, it's wonderful that we can put aside our difficulties and our situations and circumstances and just reach out to others and love on them. Amen? Sometimes when I, I've been the lowest, I've reached out to someone and, 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 and just tried to, to love on them and bless them. And, and I, I felt myself being picked up and elevated in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. These verses show us Job's uh, co co compassion uh, who brought help and happiness to others. Job rescued, we read about it, those who were thieves. I mean, he, he, those robbers, he took back, he took back what was stolen and, and, and gave it back to, to those who had it stolen from them. Verses 18 to 20, it speaks of confidence in the future. Beloved, if we ever need confidence in the future, it's not in the government. It's not in our new mayor of Westfield. Sorry, mayor. It's not on the school board. It's not on the city council. It's not on the police. And I support them 100%. And it's not, it's not in any form of government. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He alone. And we need to be reminded. I need to be reminded of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have confidence in the future because the King is coming back to rescue us and take us home. 
In a new heaven, new, no more cancer, no more sickness, no more pain, no more rheumatoid arthritis, no more diets, no more this, no more that. We're going to be in a, we're going to be, I'm not going to be on a harp in some cloud. I'm going to spend eons just at the master's feet, bathing praise and worship to the King of Kings. And guess what? I'm getting warmed up right now before I get to heaven. God, give us a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in. That'll preach. That'll really preach. This was another source of Job, Job's joy. God was blessing Job, and Job was sharing those blessings with others. And then, we could, we could preach a message on it and title it, And Then. Job 29.20 suggests that Job expected to stay in good health and vitality. Listen, I mean, whatever sickness you have in your body right now, you weren't born thinking, you know, as you grew up and understood everything, well, that's just, that's just what I'm going to get. Right? That's how I'm going to be. This is the whole situation and circumstances of life. And that, no, no. Life throws us curves. Life is filled with pain. And life is difficult. Sometimes to even function. But you're in the right place at the right time. You brought yourself up by the scuff of the neck to get out to the house of God. You said, regardless of what anybody sings, says, I don't care what they say about my voice. I'm going to let it go. Let it rip, baby. If they like it, fine. If they block their ears, I'm still going to praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. So 2920, it suggests that Job is expected to stay in all this, you know, good health. I love that word. Uh, you know, I love it because I had to look it up. <laughs> suffused in, in, in this translation, my soul suffused. It means my soul was permeated with the glory of God and my body was robust until I died. Oh, how we need the blessings of God on us. Then Job's final joy was, uh, was his words of encouragement to help others in 21 through 25. And, and, and what, was, what, what, was, what was Job, Pastor? What, what kind of a dude was he? He was a Barnabas. He was an encourager. He encouraged people. And then he needed some encouragement. He needed some love. There's some people in this house that need some love, but you're looking in all the wrong places. There's no greater love than, than that, 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 that Jesus would lay down himself and you and I would lay down our life for a brother or a sister. That love of God. Hallelujah. He's a Barnabas. He's a son of encourager. Yes, Job uh, enjoyed a rich, rewarding life, but, but now, now everything he had, his respectability, it seemed like it was taken away, and he lost focus. I'm preaching to a preacher today that's preaching to you, and I'm preaching to you. We have lost focus. Our, 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 our priorities, I'm going to put it right in everyday language, are messed up. God is no longer uno number one. He is, well, when it's convenient, I'll, I'll be there. I'll do that. I'll, yes, Lord. But I believe today God wants to renew us with a right relationship with him. Job looked back. He looked back. What else did he do? Secondly, Job looked around. Looking around can get us in trouble. You can come to church today and look around and say, man, that, that dress doesn't look good on her. <laughs> that hairstyle doesn't look good on him. Wish that dude would shave. <laughs> I mean, looking around can get us in trouble. And I think sometimes Christians do that really well, don't we? We look around. But this is in chapter 30. He looks around. From the joys of the past, Job is suddenly thrust and, and, and back into the reality of the dismal present. Some people are so worried about, <laughs> well, you know, we, we're worried about the sweet by and by. We need to live in the naughty now and now. It's going to be sweet, but we're living in the naughty now and now. Where sometimes it's not so sweet. Job 31 says, but no longer. Now I am the butt of their jokes. Job knew he had to face the music and, uh, uh, of the present and, and people who refuse to come to grips with life are in danger of losing touch with reality and will soon lose touch with themselves. That would be a message for another time, out of touch. I want to be in touch with God. But refusing to live in the past and, and honestly facing reality, Job matured and, and he excelled in integrity. So I want to share five 
complaints that Job has that parallels the joys. How many know that we can, we can have joy and then just switch the flick, just, just switch that, that uh, switch, and, and all of a sudden we, we complain. We murmur, right? We complain. First of all, what is this first complaint? I, I have no respect. Chapter 30, verses 1 through 15, Job is now mocked by those who, re, who, uh, who re respected him. They're spitting in his face. I mean, I, I heard uh, John Blunt who, who spoke, and he's the head of our men's ministry in our, in our network, and, and he was a youth pastor, and this ruffian came to the youth group, and, and some of the kids were fasting and praying and believing God, and, and, and they started praying when this person, this kid ran in and came into the place, and, and he was trying to wreak havoc in the place, and, and so John took him outside, and the young person spit in his face. I've had a lot of things happen to me. I, I had somebody try to hit me. Right at, yeah, after I left church, they were behind a tree, came out real tall guy, a uh, little taller than you, my friend. You know, well, I felt like it, but I didn't have to. He had a rock in his, my dad was behind the tree with a rock in his hand, and he said, son, if he would have raised his hand to you, I'd have knocked him out. Thank God that didn't happen. My dad would be in jail. People, listen to me, people are leaving the ministry. They're dropping like flies. They're going through COVID. And, and don't get me wrong, but I, when I was on Facebook, I read about that so many preachers discouraged, wanting to give in and give up. Now, I'm not telling you that I always have the victory, but I want to tell you it's not going to get sweeter. It's not going to get easier. You say, well, hey, you know, the normal. There's not going to be a, a, a normal we're in the battle. And the obstacle is he has, I have no respect. He's now mocked. He feels like Ro Roger Dangerfield. I, I can't get no respect. Just can't get any respect. That was Job. Job compared these young men that, 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 that disrespected him. He, he compared their fathers to donkeys. He was ticked off. He said, well, boy, he should have done that. He was upset. He compared them to donkeys wandering in the desert. He called them children of fools. In, in the IV, verse, verse 8. And at one time, Job was the greatest man in the east. And in verse 9. But now, he says, I'm the one they're after. They're mistreating me. They're taunting me. They're mocking me. Once respected, now he's despised. You getting some of the, how he's feeling? He's still a man of God. Verse 11, the NIV says they made Job's life miserable. And how many know that misery likes company? I'm just so miserable. <laughs> so miserable. There's nothing worse than a miserable saint. I told somebody that one time. I did, really. Person didn't like it. And I was surprised I said it. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was true. They were miserable. They were mean. How many know that sometimes Christians can be meaner than a junkyard dog? With sharp teeth. It's not just the world. If you've been in church life long enough, you know that. Amen? So, so he's once respected. I mean, it's like a pastor. He's greater than Swiss cheese. Then people can't receive from him. Because something went awry, right? He, he, you know, he's... Anyway. <laughs> they made Job's life miserable. Help me, Father. They were ruthless, laying traps for him, attacking him, verses 12 through 14. And, and Job, didn't, Job didn't know, but, but he was being honored. Listen to this. Job didn't know or to realize it, but he was being honored. God was being honored in the mess. Can we be trusted to be tried? He handpicked Job. Said, go ahead, Satan. Go ahead. What's Job's second complaint? He says, I have no blessing. Job uh, chapter 30, 16 through 23. What, what, a, what, a, 
What a, what a predicament to be in. What a contrast from, from the days of great blessing in 29, 26 to the days of affliction in verse 16 of this 30th chapter. Job groans. Have you ever groaned? He didn't want to get out of bed. When I believe God wants to give us the victory so that, that the enemy, he, he is so afraid of Corey that, 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 that when, when Corey gets out of bed and his little, little bitty, little, little bitty toe hits the ground, the enemy begins to shake and quake. <laughs> I know we laugh, but you know what? I believe we can be in the presence of God and we, and we can really put some misery on the enemy. I believe a church that's full bore for God can really, really, really tick the enemy off. I believe that church could be New Life Christian Center. I believe it can happen today. I believe God is looking for people that, that love the Lord with all their heart, that, that, that are willing to sell out to Jesus Christ. If you're wondering what it was, I just kicked a pin. I dropped it on the ground. I saw some of you, you're going to break your nicks. I had to pray for you in this prayer service afterwards. <laughs> I'm sorry. God, why do I feel like you've forsaken me? Job felt like God was robbing him of his enjoyment in life. I want to tell you that serving Jesus is not a drudgery. If it's a drudgery to you, maybe you shouldn't serve him. If it's all that bad. Pastor, that's strong. It's, it's, it's tough. But what a privilege it is to serve him. Amen? Amen. This isn't for the weak. In the daytime, Job endured great suffering, and at night, he wrestled with him, and, a, and, he, and he lost. I, I've wrestled with God. Every wrestling match I got with God, I lost every one of them. How about you? I mean, if you win a wrestling match with God, that means you're living in disobedience. Verses 16 to 19. Verse 20, Job prayed to God, I stand to face you in protest. You gave me a blank stare. Here's the greatest man in the East. He says, you gave me a, a blank stare, God. You've turned into my tormentor. You, you, you slapped me around. You, 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 know, you know me about it, and, and you've raised me up so that I was riding high, and then you dropped me to, to, a, to a crash. See, I'm here to tell you that the trials can either make us better or bitter. The trials will, the trials will either increase our, our, our thought of God in our, in our theological view of God, or it's going to mess us up. It's in the trials that that happens. It's not in the victories. We've got to remain true. God didn't change. Hey, listen, if I feel God has wandered away, if I, if I feel distant from God, who moved? I moved away from him. He didn't move away from me. So Job prays to God. What's the third complaint? The third complaint is, I have no help. You ever felt that way? Chapter 30, verses 24 and 25. What did I do to deserve this? Ever said that to God? God, what? How come? Why me? You could have picked a thousand other people. You could have picked a thousand other people to, to, to work with, with the kids or with youth or, or, or greeting or, or somebody else. But, but, but God, you picked me. Why me, God? And why, why do I have to endure such pain and such, and such heartache? Did I ever hit anybody that was calling for help? Even though they might have deserved it? Haven't I wept for those who, who live a hard life, been heart sick over the, over the lot of the poor? God, remember that? Remember that? Remember that, Lord. But Lord, where did it get me? I don't always quote Mark Twain, but I'll quote him today. If you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he won't bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and a man. Hello? Ever had anybody bite you? I'm not talking about dogs. I'm talking about human beings. Oh, yeah. That bite can hurt. We help others because... Because we love Jesus. Winfield Greenfield says this. He says, the service that we render for others is really the rent we pay for our room on this earth. Oh, do I like that. Let's say it one more time. 
The service we render for others is really the rent we pay for our room here on earth. Verses 26 to 28 of chapter 30, Job's fourth complaint, I have no future. Listen to me, I'm here to tell you, according to Jeremiah, we have a future and we have a hope. But Job felt like, but even though we know that, there's sometimes we don't feel like we have, we, we, we just compare our church to some church over across ourselves. You know, we're not this, we're not that. Don't try to be anybody else. Let's just be ourselves yielded to God. Let's not try to duplicate what a church down the street or some other place is doing. It's not about numbers. It's not about finances. Those are side issues. It's about surrender. It's about surrender. He felt like he had no future. And, and during his days of, uh, of prosperity, Job expected to enjoy a long, comfortable life. But now it seems like the opposite. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever done anything in your life ever before that you wish that you had not done that you could change? I'm going to be so bold. Could you raise your hand if you feel that way? And all those of you who haven't, either you misunderstood the question or you're not being truthful. And that's not only B.C., before Christ. That's even after we accept him. I'm going to tell you, God is good, though. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Instead of comfort and peace, it's turmoil within. 30, verse 27, my, my stomach is in a constant churning. Never settle down. Hope is, hope is, uh, is, is, the, <laughs> is something that I, I once had, but I don't have it anymore. It's, it's, it's the least of my possessions right now. Listen, if you've lost hope, then be reintroduced to hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't lose hope in the battle. Then what does he say? His fifth complaint is this. I don't have a ministry. Everybody has a ministry. If you're breathing, you have a ministry. Amen. Everybody has a ministry. Everyone has a ministry. Because Job's hope was dead. Job's song was a funeral dirge. I'm going to say something to you. I love you with all my heart, but some, you've been singing funeral songs. And you need to sing wedding songs. Amen. That's what some of those songs on the queue do. I just bypass them. I, I, I like the queue. I listen to the queue. Don't misunderstand me. But when they start talking about just me and all this and all self-centered, I don't need that. I need a God who's going to put his finger and hand in my face and say, son, you are who I said you are. And you need to get your head up off the ground and you need to look onto the hills from which comes your help and you need to fill your heart with songs of theology and songs of rejoicing and victory. Amen. I'm going to say it. I wouldn't give two cents for some of those songs. They might be good in your private room, but they're not good to sing publicly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, am I getting myself in trouble? So lastly, what does Job do? I mean, he, look, he, looks, he looks back, he looks around, and, uh, and I believe the Lord's trying to say to us, stop looking around. We need to look ahead for God's justice. And that's what the 31st chapter is this. Chapter 31 records Job's final defense. It's like, it's like a legal document in which Job puts himself under oath before God and asks for judgment to fall if God can prove him wrong. Now, I'm telling you, Job 31, 35 to 37. For me, I'd be very careful to pray that prayer. But he did. Job's only hope, and our only hope, is that God will hear our cry. God hears your cry. You say, well, he hasn't answered. He hasn't answered the way we want to have him answered. But he's here. he hears our cry. How many believe that he hears our cry? Amen, he does. He does. Job's only hope, and our only hope is that God will hear our cry. Job would die in, 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 in peace if he knew that his enemies had been silenced and his reputation had been restored. That's what he's saying. Verse 35, oh, if only someone would give me a hearing. He wants to go to court. I don't want to go to court with God. Not me. Maybe you, but not me. I already know what the verdict's going to be. I'm not good enough in my of myself. I need his grace and mercy, and I need his blood on my life constantly. I admit that. He said, I've signed my name to my defense. Let the Almighty one answer. You have to be careful how you pray. Remember that story I 
started off with, I never want to pastor a church in a house. <clears throat> That's where I ended up. <laughs> Got to be careful what you pray. And I'm glad that God doesn't, doesn't answer all of our Mickey Mouse prayers. Because we've been dead a long time ago. Oh, I wish I'd die. <laughs> Three quarters of you wouldn't be here today. Right? So Job was willing. I'm going to close with this. Job was willing to give God an accounting of his every step. Job was not a hypocrite, even though he was going through all this and he was feeling down. He loved the Lord. Listen, when you're going through that and, and things don't make any sense, and you're going, it doesn't mean that you're a hypocrite. You're going through some deep waters. And God wants to bring you through. Amen? So, so Job the man, it, it deals with it in, in chapter 31, uh, you know, 1 through 12. And Job shares three things that trip us up. 1 through 4, then 5 through 8, and then 9 through 12. The first one is lust. Lust will trip us up. Lust will trip anybody up. Amen? Then the second one is deceit. Verses 5 through 8. Deceit. Being deceitful. That will always trip us up. And then this one will certainly always trip us up. Verses 9 through 12. Adultery. I said it will trip us up and eat us up and swallow us up. If we don't confess it. And then... Not only Job the man, but Job the employer. Look at it. Verses 13 through 15 in chapter 31. Job treated his servants generously. Treat people generously, even if they don't treat you generously. It's amazing what you know. We went out to Chinese food. Hadn't had, I don't know if I told you that, Gail. We went out to Chinese food. She was here. I was there. And it was good Chinese food. And this waitress, she just, looked particularly that she needed some, some encouragement. And you know, it doesn't take a lot. Well, my, my food's not hot enough. <laughs> some, some waitresses and waiters do not like Sunday afternoons after church. You know why? Because Christians come into those restaurants. <laughs> oh, I'm going to give you a tip. Yeah. We just loved on this lady, and she was blown away. I'm not bragging about that. Just simple Things as being kind to one another. Everybody needs an encouraging word, right? Everybody needs. I don't, I don't think you should look at this as a discouraging word. Here's Job that, that, that's true and faithful to God, but he's going through some stuff. And then Job the neighbor in verses uh, 16 uh, and, uh, of chapter 31, uh, verses 23, 29 through 32. Job the neighbor. Job responds. Repeated to Eliapaz, remember that dude, that he, one of his friends, how he, how he was treated and, and cared for the poor and the needy, but now um, he, re, he repeated it as a, as a part of his oath. He's making an oath to God. God, I've, I've done this for you and for, to the audience of one and for you and now. And when you do that and when I do that, God will be faithful to bring it to pass, even through the toughest times. Then, then God, I, I did this, but Job felt if I, I've, lifted, I've lifted a hand against anybody, God, and then you just rip my arm off, God. Boy, be careful, boy. None of us would have any arms. Think of it. Just rip it out of the socket, God. Job was concerned for the needs of widows and orphans and the poor, and we need to be too. We have, we have widows in this church. God bless you. We love you. I hope that we don't just say it behind the pulpit. You know, once every once in a while, the Word of God says he, he cared for the widows and the orphans and the poor. Job was, a, was, a, was generous to, to strangers, and, and we had a stranger come by this week. We don't just give money. Maybe you do, but we don't just give money. What we did is, is we took her over to the gas station. I took the church card and personally put the fuel in her tank would not give her the money to spend on whatever she would spend it on because this is God's money. Money that you tithe on. Money that you give. That you ask your board and pastor to be responsible for. But we blessed her nonetheless and we prayed for her. Because we want to use wisdom. Because I want to tell you, there are sincere people and there are cons. And they'll go to the church and you say, well, that's not very compassionate. We need discernment. So what we did is we were able to bless her that way. Job says, I've done that. I've given. I've given to those who worked for me. I fed them. And you know what? Not only did I feed them, I was generous. I gave them a second helping. 
I was so generous. God's people ought to be generous. I mean, quite frankly, we don't need your tithes. God doesn't need your money. But how many know he needs us? And when he gets us, he gets it all. And then not only that, but I want you to see in verses 24 to 28, Job the worshiper. When you come to church or wherever you are, don't wait for anybody else. Just be a worshiper. Be a worshiper. And then Job the steward, verses 38 through 40. Job always made sure he was a good steward of what God had blessed him with. He was a good steward of his tithe. He was a good steward of his time. And he was a good steward of his talent. I'm here to tell you as a pastor, the church still needs you. Whether it's in some epidemic or whatever somebody else is talking about, you know, and people are fearful. And, and yes, people are, people are sick and people are dying. And make no mistake about that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But, but, I, but I'll tell you, in, in the middle of all that, there's a plate over there. And it says tithes and offerings. It's a privilege to give to God. But not just my money. I want to give my time. I want to give my talent. I want to give it all to you, Lord. And you say, I'm not talented. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I'm going to find out what some of those talents are. I'm going to. God knows you're talented. Stand with me. We're going to conclude. Whew, I feel better now. Because I just have this, just so much. So much. When the words of Job had ended, listen to this. Everyone sat there in silence. They sat there in silence. Would God send his judgment and prove jo Job wrong? His sidekicks were thinking. Job had challenged God because, because he knew God and only God would vindicate him. I'm here to tell you only God can vindicate us. Job's three friends were sure that God would condemn him. But listen, church. I'm here to tell you that Wayne Hartsgrove doesn't keep the books and the Assemblies of God doesn't keep the books, but God keeps the books. And he knows what's done in private and he knows what's done in public. And he keeps the books. And I rest my case with that. I rest my case with that. My life, if I was ever reminded of it, it was yesterday spending it with some men. My life is in God's hands. This church is in God's hands. If God called Wayne and Gail Hartsgrove out of here tomorrow, this church is still in God's hands because it's not built around Wayne and God and Gail Hartsgrove. I made a mistake and said, Gail, sometime I called her God. <laughs> I did. I said, God, I meant to say Gail. <laughs> but I want, I want you to know that even though none of us are expendable, he needs us. He needs us. Father God, I just want to thank you for your word today. Lord, I, I just feel a peace in my heart, God. I thank you, Jesus. No pain, no gain. You're the only one that's going to vindicate us, Lord. You're the only one that can take every wrong and make it right, Lord. And oh God, I'm sure there's, there's plenty, of, there's just a source of memory and things that are going through your people's mind right now, Lord. As maybe some of the things I've, I've preached today has unearthed some things. But Lord, we can look back. We can look around. But help us to look forward. But more importantly, help us to look up. Because our redemption draws nigh. And so Father, I pray that everyone here this morning knows you as their Lord and Savior. And if they don't, I'm going to stay right here at the altar and meet them at the altar. And we're going to pray together. And these altars are open to, to those, oh God, that feel like maybe your Holy Spirit has, has put your gracious hand on something, some area that needs healing in our lives. God, I thank you for that, Lord. To be honest with you, um, I wasn't feeling all that well, but you touched me, God, even during the preaching of your word. And I'm grateful, God. I'm grateful, God. I'm grateful, God. I'm thankful. We're going to close by singing that hymn again. I'm going to invite you to come. If you don't want to come, the last song that we did, we're going to close with that, okay? And um, I just want you to know that I, that I love you in the Lord, and I'm grateful for each and every one of you. And on and, and, and behalf of my lovely wife and myself, we want to wish you a blessed, blessed Thanksgiving. 
We love you. You know, we had one um, African-American guy. He was like, he was a bouncer, right? And he was one of the speakers. Now we'll mess with that dude. He was big, man, big. And, and uh, after he spoke and people clapped and I loved what he did. All he did was this. You know what I do today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that I'm not what I used to be. I mean that. Y'all wouldn't have liked what I used to be, and I might not like what you used to be. But I say to you, stop looking back. Stop looking around at everybody else and take a deep look within. And then make sure that we look ahead. The future is as bright as the promises of God. And certainly make sure that we look up. Because our redemption draws close. This might be the last service that we're here together. The rapture could take place. And if it does, and you're not serving God, have church without me. Because there will be people that will flock to churches during that time. Because they're calling up people that, that they loved and knew they were saved and they can't talk to them anymore because they're not here anymore. Okay, so let's sing that. If you want to come forward, you can. If not, we're going to close with that last song.